Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Senator John Hines. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great high privilege and the greatest of personal pleasures to introduce to you the President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Reverend Clergy and our two, your two senators here, and for the, because of them, I sleep easier at night in Washington, knowing all the things that can happen if there aren't enough Republicans around. <laughs> all the others who are here. Um, I had some remarks here. But John has just told me that possibly you'd rather have a dialogue and maybe some questions and answers than uh, me standing here and giving a lecture on why we ought to have the budget passed immediately. And uh, if so, that's what uh, I'll do. I'll be very happy to put this back in my pocket. Let me just say now, though, that seriously, the importance of this Senate race this year I'm sure you must know, the few vote margin that we have in the one house, and for the first time in a quarter of a century, that we have at least one house of the, of the Congress, uh, Republican. There would be no budget cuts such as we've known them. There would be no tax cuts as we've had. I don't think there would be the rebuilding of our, and the necessary rebuilding of our national security if we did not have that majority. And we have that majority in large part because a gentleman here on the platform was in charge of the committee that handled the election uh, two years ago, Congressional Committee John Hines. And because of that, we're in that good position. But I'm going to lose a lot of sleep if I ever thought that I had eight years in California of being up against uh, both houses of the legislature on the opposite side. And it almost got to be a habit. I voted, I vetoed 993 bills. Uh, 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 so uh, I don't want a repeat of that kind of career. But John did a great job in that for the Senate. And he's, both of your senators are doing a great job. And I know that we're going to have one back for sure. And I think I'm going to say we're going to have two back for sure, because I think you know how important it is. Now, you've possibly heard some rumors to the effect that we're discussing a budget uh, in Washington now. And if so, if you would like, uh, fire away and we'll have a dialogue instead of a monologue. There's a... Since I've been in office, what has been my greatest contribution to the United States? Well, it's one that I would have to share the credit with an awful lot of uh, not only our Republican representatives and senators, but also some good responsible Democrats who also joined us. And that is the turning around of the direction that government was taking. Uh, when we took office, the interest rates were 21.5%. Uh, 
Inflation was 12.4%, and it was the second year in a row that we'd had back-to-back double-digit inflation. The unemployment, it is true, was not as deep as it is today, but there's no question it had started clear back in 79. And as a matter of fact, I was campaigning about the tragedy of that unemployment in 1980. And all of these factors seem to be uh, worsening. But the, while the inflation or the interest rates have not come down to where we want them, uh, they're down about 20%. We reversed, oh, incidentally, spending, government spending was increasing at a rate of 17% a year. Uh, the budget we've presented for next year will only represent about a 6.8% increase in spending. And we're aiming at even a lower rate of increase to where the budget will finally, or the cost of government will be increasing no faster than the general increase that comes with growth in our tax revenues and then we will be back where we should have been uh, a lot of years ago. What? A shorter answer would be that you're the president. <laughs> I'm even a, I know that everybody didn't hear that, and I'm a little hesitant to even <laughs> repeat it. I'll let somebody else say, tell it. yes. Well, we do have your Navy shipyard uh, pretty busy right now. Uh, I, c I couldn't tell you with regard to all the defense uh, contracts that can be let uh, and will be let, uh, where they're going to go. I must say that, however, the first priority is going to be uh, where the job can be done the most economically and at the same time uh, do it the way it's, it's necessary for our national security. I also can say that if there's ever a place where everything else is equal, then I would, and, and it was a choice, then I would think that you choose those places where it could also help the economy. But let me say about your unemployment here, the most necessary thing that has to be done the Senate just recently passed out of the Budget Committee, the Senate Re Republicans passed out a budget program for uh, 1983. I have been meeting in the last week or so with business leaders, chief executives, with the leaders of the small business community, which is the one that produces about 80% of our new jobs, uh, heads of farm organizations, trade organizations, and with the, the money world, bankers and financiers and uh, investment trusts and so forth, all of them have one thing to say, and if, and if I don't say it first, they say it back to me. That is interest rates, which are the big block to faster recovery, will come down if, if and when the Congress passes this budget and guarantees that for the second year in a row we're continuing on the path of reducing government spending then the rates will come down. They tell me that the one thing that's keeping them up is simply having been burned in the seven or eight recessions that have taken place since World War II, where the government turned to a quick fix, flooded the money market, artificially stimulated and make the economy look as if it was getting well. This morning I described that as trying to cure a fever by eating the thermometer. And, <laughs> and then up came inflation again, and if they had loaned money on the basis of lower inflation, they would be stuck with these long-term loans at a rate that was too low to match the depreciating value of their money. And we now have inflation. I didn't add this with what we've done. We have inflation down from that 12.4% to where for six months it's averaged 3.2%. And last month, for the first time in 17 years, it went below zero. The prices actually were going down, not just not increasing as fast in price. That enough, that is enough, if they have the confidence that we're going to continue and that we're not going to do that other quick fix thing. So anything you can do to pressure and make sure that the Congress will give us those additional cuts. And may I also say, and I'm taking too much time in this answer, 
all this talk of budget cuts, all this talk of that we're doing something to the needy and the poor and we're not taking care of the people who must have help from the rest of us. There have been no budget cuts. All we've cut is the projected increase by the big spenders, the amount they want to increase the budget. The 81 budget, which we inherited, which was already there, and we managed to reduce by about 13 billion, even though we only had a few months left of the year to do it in, uh, that budget was bigger than the 1988. The present 82 budget is bigger than 81, and the 83 budget we've submitted will represent about a 6.8% increase over the present budget. But where it comes to the poor, the, the poor and the needy and that all the people that, as I say, must have help, and I've said that we'd preserve a safety net. In 1980, in the last Carter budget, $195 billion was Dick Schweiker, would, was the Health and Human Services budget. Now Dick Schweiker, who's secretary of that and doing a great job with that. Dick's budget for 83 will be, remember, 195 and a fraction in, uh, in 1980. His budget for 83 will be 274 billion and a fraction. And that is a bigger percentage of the entire budget than the Carter budget for humanitarian affairs was. And uh, it happens to be the third largest budget in the world. The only two budgets greater is the entire budget for the United States and the entire budget for the Soviet Union. So we are keeping the safety net. And yet, at the same time, we're making the savings that can bring by, back the economy. Yes. When you were elected president by the majority of the people that cared enough to go out and vote, you said that you wanted to get the government off the backs of the people and that you were a strong believer in free enterprise and the private sector. I also feel this way, so my question to you is, what are you doing or what would you like to do in regards to breaking up some of the monopolistic structures in this country, whether they be private or governmental, so that the small guy could have the opportunity to break into the free enterprise yeah. system? Well, this is what are we doing to, with regard to monopolies and to give the smaller man a chance to get started. Actually, I think that our very tax program, for one thing, is of great benefit to independent business. The overwhelming majority of them pay the personal tax, not the corporate tax. There is no relaxing of, in the field of antitrust or anti-monopoly in the part of, of our government uh, at this time, nor will there be. And so I, all I can tell you is that that is still part of it. At the same time, however, for all business, uh, big and little, but particularly the small businessmen, George Bush is heading up a task force aimed at something else we promised, and that is the blizzard of paperwork that is imposed on the private sector today and on local and state government today by excessive federal regulations and unnecessary regulations. And he has made a tremendous cut. There are 23,000 fewer pages in the Federal Register which lists the federal regulations. The actual savings amounts to about, I won't put it in cash, amounts to a savings of about 200 million man hours of work filling out government paper, government to comply with government regulations. So I think that, I think that the path is as open as it has ever been or better for uh, the entrepreneur, small business. And we have, in addition to, for, to the, just the simple tax rates, income tax rates, we have done some other things in which we have increased and it will be phased in even higher, uh, eventually the elimination of the inheritance tax, which will be a great salvation for family-owned businesses that in the past have had to sell the business in case of death in order to pay the, uh, the inheritance taxes. Uh, that is one thing that we have done, uh, the regulatory thing, and there are other things in the, in the tax brackets the same way of benefit to uh, too small business. Now, I'm, I hear a lady's voice, and there has been. Yes. In light of the budget difficulties you were expressing, would you ever consider reducing the defense budget? Reducing the defense budget. The defense budget, incidentally, today is only 29% of our budget. 
Back in the days of President Kennedy, the defense budget was running about 46% of the national budget. But there have been a, several, we're trying to make up for a number of years of starvation. When I became president, at any given day, half our airplanes couldn't get off the ground for lack of spare parts. Many of our ships couldn't leave Port Harbor, Navy vessels, for the same reason. We only had a very limited supply of ammunition. And in one of those computerized uh, war games where you see what would happen if, for example, uh, uh, there was an attack on the NATO line in Europe and so forth, uh, we lost in three weeks. Now, the bulk of our budget is for maintenance and pay. We also had a volunteer military that was based on wartime draft wages. And we were losing non-commissioned officers faster than uh, we could promote them, simply because they couldn't afford. They were actually eligible for welfare at the time that they were serving in the non-commissioned ranks in our military. So the bulk of our budget's going for that. But I do anticipate a time when it won't be as great. We have asked the Soviet Union, as you know, to sit down with us with regard to not only the reduction, reduction, not limitation, reduction of nuclear arms, but in Vienna we're meeting, hoping to get reductions in conventional arms, and in Geneva right now we're meeting with regard to the strategic missiles that they have aimed at Europe, from Eastern Europe, and we have nothing to counter that there, or our allies don't, and we're going to provide Pershing missiles. And when we announced that, the Soviets said they would sit down and talk disarmament with us, or arms limitation. What I think is that we have strengthened our case for getting arms reductions by going forward with a military buildup. For the last 10 years, they've sat opposite us at any table discussing this, and they're building the greatest military buildup in history, but they saw us unilaterally disarming. There wasn't any reason for them to give up and meet us in any kind of disarmament, but I can explain it all with a cartoon that I love very much that appeared recently. It was Brezhnev speaking to a Russian general, and he said, I liked the arms race better when we were the only ones in it. <laughs> No, the gentleman behind you. <laughs> yeah, because here I get to write the script too. They want this to be the last. The last oh, oh dear. Oh, they tell me. Uh, Has there been cooperation? Now, wait a minute. But Another way, is to make long term cooperation and coordination of the Treasury Department and the Fed in order to make your job easier. I think that we have a better relationship than we started out now, and, and largely thanks to Don Regan, as Secretary of the Treasury. And I must say that the, the Fed is cooperating, and there is not, as some people suspect, that the interest rates are where they are because they are uh, going too deep in. Uh, in reducing the money supply, no, they are on a, a steady track that I think is uh, is proper with our growth today, and I I believe that they, like those other people I quoted, uh, will be the first to be willing to bring down the interest rates, the prime rate, the discount rate, when we prove that we can get the Congress to adopt this this budget. So now I've just been told by the senator here that that uh, there's only time for one more, and there's a there's a little late. Oh, well I'll take two more then. I'll make the answer shorter. All right. Okay. All right. Here. All right. How do we justify selling weapons to Jordan, uh, high-level uh, fighters and so forth, at the same time in our agreement with and our alliance with uh, uh, Israel? 
Well, first of all, uh, there has been no request as yet. There's been a lot of talk that I've read about it also. There's been no formal request from Jordan. But on the other hand, it is uh, whatever is done, I want you to know what our policy is and what we're trying to accomplish. And Prime Minister Begin knows this. Uh, Menachem and I exchange letters uh, all the time on these subjects. <laughs> we think one of the, and uh, yes, we're on a first name basis now. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of a shock to the striped pants fellows over in the State Department that we call each other by the first name, but we do. And he knows that I met it when I pledged to him that we will never allow them to uh, their qualitative and quantitative military advantage uh, to be uh, done away with, but that what we're trying to do with the more moderate uh, Arab states is persuade them to become additional Egypts, to do as Egypt did. The greatest thing that we can do for Israel is to bring peace to the Middle East. And if we're to be a believable broker, we can't impose that peace, of course. But if we are to be believable, then those moderate Arab states, and I met with King Hussein and must say that uh, I was greatly impressed by his whole approach and his views uh, toward the Middle East. If we can persuade them to acknowledge the right of Israel to exist as a nation and enter into negotiations in that Camp David framework as Egypt did, that will be the greatest thing we can do. And in order to do that, we have to show them that we're willing to uh, be a friend other than just uh, uh, talking about it. But as I say, uh, the Prime Minister knows that, that uh, we are pledged and I believe morally bound in a commitment to the preservation of the State of Israel that it must continue to exist. <laughs> now, and then this one has to be the last one, they tell me. This is about our alliance with uh, our neighbors to the south and the other continent and my statements about an accord in which the full strength and the development can go forward of North and South America. And we did, I think we have established better relations on the North American continent now uh, than we've ever had with Mexico and Canada. But, and I have just um, seen the president of Brazil off who has been visiting in Washington with us and as you know, there has been some, quite some ill feeling between Brazil and the United States for some time. I think I can safely say uh, they realize there's a whole new relationship now there. The tragedy of the Falklands Island, the, the quarrel that's going on there, I'm worried has perhaps, uh, and I hope only temporarily, uh, slowed what we intend to be uh, a real relationship and an accord with our neighbors to the south. Uh, the, we've done our best and are continuing to do everything we can to again broker a peace down there. At the same time, we can't, we can't ignore the fact that the aggressor was our neighbor here in, this, in these continents, Argentina, who with military force invaded uh, the Falklands and took over. And if we, we, we must establish that that cannot happen in the world, that the rule of law prevails, not the rule of force. Where would we draw the line if we say, well, it's all right there, then how many other places are there in the world where there are boundary disputes? And do we literally say, well, it's all right for the one that thinks they're strong enough to do it to go and grab the territory? And we've been trying, as I say, it has been very frustrating. We sometimes come where it seems as if we're almost to agreement and then 
Uh, there still seems to be one hitching point, but we're going to keep on trying uh, to bring that peace. And then I recognize that because uh, uh, of our longtime friendship for Britain, that there are probably those in, the, in Latin America who have now drawn back and who feel that uh, uh, maybe we weren't sincere in our overtures to them, but we're going to go right back at that because the dream that I nurse above all is that if you look at the potential of these two continents linked by Central America, uh, 600 million people uh, here in these two continents, probably a wealth of resources of virtually everything that you need for an industrial society, so much of it's still underdeveloped, and all of us bound together by the common heritage that we were all once colonies, and we now are all independent. We want freedom for ourselves. And um, I think the rest of the world would really have to look on in awe if they saw us with our democratic ideals banded together here, not giving up our national sovereignty or our culture or customs or languages, but friendly allies bound together in the Western Hemisphere. And this is, this is our dream, and we'll have at it again if we can just finish off this little business that's going on down, down there right now. Thank you all very much. All I want to do is say thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll say something about you. For some Please. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Please. And the thank you that I have just said several times for your warmth of, of welcome and your kindness is only a fraction of what the thank you will be if in November you've told me that you're sending John Hines back to Washington. <laughs> Mr. President, first, uh, let me extend on behalf of all your friends here in this audience today and the millions of Pennsylvanians that uh, we count among your friends, not only an extension of our sincere thanks and gratitude for your being here, but the warmest of welcomes to this, the Keystone State. We are proud to have you. Let me say to all our guests that I'm well aware that April 15th was a very taxing day for many of you. And to follow it up on May 14th with the kind of invitations and, that you've had today just shows that the Republican Party is alive and well and growing here in Pennsylvania. And thirdly, Mr. President, and last, permit me one personal observation about you and your job. Mr. President, we all do know that there is no job more difficult than that of President of the United States. It is also the job that is the most important job in the entire world. So it's not surprising that the American people over time have developed expectations that go far beyond what anybody could realistically hope one man to achieve. When you consider the next to impossible expectations that a president has to meet while seeking to expand our horizons and most importantly to build a country that is not only better today but a land of growing opportunity for all Americans in the future. We should be proud, we should be happy to have men of the foresight, of the courage, of the great quality that we have in the White House today. Mr. President.
Mr. President, I think you know you have a lot of friends. We welcome you to this, our family, and we hope that uh, when you can take any more time from your very burdensome, heavy responsibilities in Washington, we hope you will come back as soon as you possibly can. Again, but until then, our thanks, our blessings, and Godspeed.